Yes, perfect. Thanks a lot for the introduction, and thanks for having me. So, as uh, Mr. Dub already said, I already revealed because actually I wanted to. I wanted you to read this headline. So it says, "Car involved in fatal accident in Arizona." It's believed to be the first pedestrian fatality attributed to a vehicle. So, if you just read it like this, it would sound really strange, right? Because we have traffic accidents every day, thousands of them. Why would this be a headline? And as you see, there's something missing here. And I mean, it's pretty obvious what's missing. Oh, who can tell me? Yeah. Yes, so it's actually a self-driving Uber car. So it has begun. Uh, the revolution has started. Um, yeah, machines are taking us over. They are killing us now. So everything that we were thinking of that Hollywood was depicting for the last 30 years is becoming a reality, right? Or not? So actually, some people are actually thinking that this might be happening. So this guy, you probably know him, he's Elon Musk, CEO of Tesla and SpaceX. He's like one of the technological leaders of our time. And a few weeks ago, I think, or a few days ago, he said the following, AI is far more dangerous than nukes, by far. So why do we have no regula regulatory oversight? This is insane. So Elon Musk says, we regulate nukes, but we don't regulate AI, although AI is much more dangerous. So this, we must be insane, right? Why are we not doing this? And Elon Musk has been one of the most prominent persons who are opponents of the technology, not, not opponents per se, but who warn us against potential conflicts that this technology might bring. Another qu quote from him a few years ago was, with AI, we are summoning the demon. So he seems to be a bit pessimistic about it, although he is although or even probably because, because he is one of the leaders in this field in technology, so he probably knows about the potentials. And many other technological leaders like Bill Gates or Stephen Hawking also warned against the dangers of AI. And this is quite funny because you see that only people that are not directly working on it are talking about it like this. If you, for example, ask real researchers who are um, actively working on AI, for example, this guy, you probably don't know him because... He's not that well-known. Somebody has seen him before? Yeah? Uh, yeah, almost, almost. He is actually, um, he's working in AI. He's a professor in Stanford. He was a professor in Stanford. He's Andrew Ng. He was one of the, or is one of the leaders in AI research, and he's actively working on AI. And he's now actually at Baidu, so at another big Chinese company who is working on AI. And what he said in response to these dangerous or to these um, critics of AI, he said the following, worrying about AI today is like worrying about overpopulation on Mars. So I think the analogy is quite clear. Overpopulation on Mars will be a problem at some point in time, but it's still quite far away, right? And he thinks that AI, with AI it's the same thing. It will be a problem at some point in time, but we're still not at that point. So you can clearly see that there's a distinction, like people who are directly working on AI, who actually see these systems, how they run, who actually um, develop these systems, they are less skeptic about them than technological leaders like Elon Musk or Bill Gates. So since I'm also working on AI, like I'm a computer scientist, I'm interested in machine learning, AI, I'm also supporting this view, and I don't think that AI will be a threat in the next 10, 20 years. So I think we should rather focus on the actual problems we have with AI system right now instead of like um, creating dystopian environments and dystopian movies about them and stopping the development or something. So what I want to talk about now is artificial intelligence. What are the actual, the current problems that we have? Like not these images of Terminator and stuff, but what are the real problems that we can tackle right now in order to make this beneficial for all of us? And I, I've identified two key points here that are very hot research topics, like I, I read lots of papers about these topics right now and people address them. And the first one is transparency and interpretability. I will go into detail later on, I will just state them now. And the second big problem is bias and prejudice. So both of these were already, uh, we already discussed a little bit about when Professor Helbing gave his introductory talk. He showed a few slides on these topics, but I will go a bit more into detail about what's happening here. And first of all, um, in order to understand this in more detail, I will give you a short introduction into AI, into the history a bit, 
and into how these systems work today, because most of you probably don't have a background in computer science and AI, so I will just give a brief overview about um, how this came along, how the development is going. So people were fascinated by artificial intelligence long before um, our society, like even in the Bible there are references to artificial beings, like golems or stuff like that, and people have always been fascinated by the idea of creating an, an artificial being that is as intelligent as a human. But actually, despite this fact that we have thought about this for so many years, the first time it actually was mentioned as a scientific field, or it was actually discussed as a discipline as on its own, was in 1955, when this, this, the scientific discipline was coined by these um, scientists here. So these are very famous scientists in the field. And they met in summer of 1955 in Dartmouth College and wrote this proposal and this was actually the time when artificial intelligence as a discipline was founded. And I just want to tell, um, show you a few lines from the abstract from this proposal. So the first line was, we propose that a two-month, ten-man study of artificial intelligence be carried out during the summer of 1956 at Dartmouth College in Hanover, New Hampshire. Then they talk about their goals. The study is to proceed on the basis of the conjecture that every aspect of learning or any other feature of intelligence can, in principle, be so precisely described that a machine can be made to simulate it. So that's the assumption that they're making, that we can, in principle, simulate everything, intelligence included. And based on this assumption, they made the goal to actually carry this out and actually to turn this into a project. Uh, project. And then the last sentence is, we think that a significant advance can be made if a carefully selected group of scientists work on it together for a summer. Okay, so this was the view back then, and you can see this is like hugely underestimating the complexity of the problem. Like It's now six years later, and we haven't made too much progress. We have made some progress, but we are not very far at doing a significant advance at comp um, creating intelligence in artificial beings. So they were hugely underestimating this project and we need to upscale this like it's not two months it's like probably two decades or two centuries and it's not 10 men but these days like thousands of people are working on it like here at ETH the classes on AI and machine learning are like the biggest classes so there's a huge interest and so many people are working on this and still the progress is not as we want it to be or as we expect it to be so just a brief overview so back then when they started this field lots of systems looked like this so you had kind of trees where you could go, for example, it asks you for the age, and then you can say, is it a young person, middle-aged person, a senior person, and then if it's young, um, is it a student, yes or no, and in the end, the decision, what you see in the end, the no, yes, means that it's, that uh, you would get a credit or not. So, for example, if you're young, and if you're no student, you would not get a credit. If you're young, and you're a student, you get a credit. If you're middle-aged, you get a credit independent of your occupation, and if you're senior, they would look at your credit rating. So this is a so-called decision tree, and this is a system which is based on logic. So you would have implemented if-then rules. There would be a person sitting on the computer and programming these rules, and then the system could make decisions, basically. And it was strictly logical. And the problem with this is that this doesn't scale up. If you have a very complex system with millions of rules, no person can sit down and hand-type these all into the computer, and also... Um, it's not what we want to do. I mean, if we want to create something that's more intelligent than us, it cannot um, just execute our commands. It must learn by itself, right? So that's why in the last years, the paradigm has shifted, and now we are looking at these kinds of models. Probably some of you uh, have seen them. They're called neural networks. And in contrast to those systems, they are driven by data. So you give them data, you give them basically experience, and they learn on their own. So you can give them, for example, images. If you want to learn a system that distinguishes images of dogs and cats, you feed the system pictures of dogs and cats, and you tell them, this is a dog, this is a cat. And then these neurons will somehow capture this notion of what, what it means to be a dog, what it means to be a cat, and they will basically learn what, how to distinguish between them. And all modern systems are based on this paradigm that you actually don't want to hard code stuff into the system, but you want it to observe your data and to learn from it. And as you can see, these models are very complex. This is a very simple one, but modern models have like millions of neurons. 
So you call them neural networks because they resemble the brain on a very high abstract basis. And you have millions of them, and this will lead to problems, as we, can see, uh, as we will see soon. So all these developments have led to huge successes. This is like 1996, where Gary Kasparov, the world champion in chess, was beaten by IBM Deep Blue, which was a, a huge breakthrough in AI. This system was based on logic. This was not a machine learning system. They had grandmasters, chess grandmasters, who were just basically distilling their knowledge into the machine. And together with a huge compute power by the IBM system, it could um, basically beat a, a human pro. And then in 2011, this is a, Brit, um, a US, US game show called Jeopardy. It's basically a trivia game where you need to answer questions. And IBM Watson, so again, IBM was developing the system, beat two champions in this game. And this was already based on machine learning. And then recently, two years ago, all of you heard about this, like Lee Sedol, the world champion in Go was beaten by AlphaGo, developed by Google DeepMind. And this was also seen as a huge breakthrough. So, yeah, but what do all these systems have in common that we have today? So, for example, we have digital assistants that help us do our everyday tasks. We have medical diagnosis systems who can maybe recognize if in an MRI image there's a disease or something. We have self-driving cars. We had a talk about this a few weeks earlier. And what all these systems have in common, actually, is that they only can do a very specific task, right? Personal assistants can only assist you. This diagnosis system can only look at um, medical pictures, and self-driving cars can only drive. And actually, if you compare it to, for example, Gary Kasparov, the world chess champion, he can do lots of other things. He can, he can walk, he can tell stories, he can peel carrots, he can cook, he can do everything that these systems can't. So it's a question whether we actually are where we want to be. So that's why there's a distinction between weak AI and strong AI. And strong AI means the opposite, that we have one system that can do everything, basically. So like a Terminator. And the assumption is, the assumption that all these people are making, for example, Elon Musk, is that we can actually build strong AI, that strong AI is theoretically possible, that we can actually build a system which has all these qualities that a human being has and is better than a human in everything. And this is actually... Nowadays, not the case. So nowadays, we, don't, we ha only have these very narrow systems that can do one task, and we are very far away from a system that can do everything that we can do. And then there's this concept of singularity. If you think this to the end, if you would have a machine that can do anything that a human can do, then it could potentially develop even smarter machines, and th they, um, they could even develop smarter machines, and you would get kind of an intelligence explosion, and this would lead to a so-called singularity, some people think that's possible. Some people even say it's only 20 years, 30 years away. Some people say it's never possible. But yeah, we will see. But it's certainly not in the near future. So yeah, that's just the background. Having said that, let's look at the actual issues that we had right now. So we are far away from the singularity thing, far, far away from, from strong AI. So one of the issues that we have right now is this issue. I will illustrate this with an example. So what you can see here, or what you probably cannot see, is a tank which is camouflaged in a forest. Um, and it's um, on purpose that you cannot see it because tanks uh, should be camouflaged. And the U.S. military actually had a neural network system in the 70s who would distinguish or who could detect camouflaged tanks in forests because this would be a huge advantage in warfare, right? If you had a system who can just tell you, is there a tank? Because humans cannot see it. And they trained a neural network that had two sets of images. They took images with a forest without any tanks, and then they took a set of images with a forest, but there were tanks hidden in it, and they were training the network to distinguish between them so that the network was, in the end, um, able to actually say, yeah, here's a tank hidden, and here's no tank hidden. So it was able to classify this, and it was a huge advance back then, and then they gave it to the Pentagon, and the Pentagon tested it on their own data, and then they found out that it's complete bullshit, actually doesn't work at all. And the reason is the, the system, uh, the, the photos without the tanks, they were shot at, um, at a cloudy day. And the, system, the photos where the tanks were in were shot at a sunny day. So the system, all the system was doing is it was learning how to distinguish between sunny days and cloudy days. But it wasn't caring about the tanks at all. So this was one of the flaws that they had in the system. And we can see this in modern systems as well. This was a study a few years ago where a system would distinguish between huskies on the left and wolves on the right. 
And it was extremely successful at distinguishing between them, which is very difficult even for humans. And then what did they find out? Well, as you can see, um, there's something different between the pictures. It's the background. So again, the, the system has learned to distinguish not, um, like not the animals themselves, but the background, because huskies were in pictures where there was snow in the background, and wolves were in pictures where there was forest in the background. So the systems actually didn't learn what they should learn. And the huge problem is, why does this happen? And the answer is we don't know, because we use these neural networks, and they are so complex, they have thousands, millions of neurons, and we actually don't know how they make the decisions, what features of the picture they actually take to say, yeah, this is a husky, this is a wolf. We don't know this. And there's a huge amount of research going on into making these systems more explainable, more interpretable, that humans can actually um, yeah, interpret them and, and know why they're doing their decisions. And this is another example, like if you take this picture, you train a neural network and it will say it's a panda. Ob obviously it is a panda, it would say it with 59, uh, 57 percent confidence, for example. And then you could um, add some random noise. People try to do that, just add some noise. And then the resulting picture would still be a panda. I mean, a, a, a human wouldn't be able to distinguish between the first and the third, right? It's exactly the same. But if you feed this again into a neural network, it would then say, now it's a gibbon with 99% confidence. So it's very easy to fool these systems um, with, yeah, with these tricks, like you just add noise and then the prediction is completely different and with very high confidence. And we, don't know un we, do we do not understand why this happens. And we are currently working on understanding this because this is a huge flaw. If you have these systems in self-driving cars and whatever, and they predict that, I don't know, there's a ball coming, but they say it's a human or something, they do a misclassification, then, I don't know, humans could die. But we don't know why they make these decisions, right? So we should try to understand these systems. Also with AlphaGo. When AlphaGo was um, playing, nobody knew why they were making certain moves. Like, there was an expert commentator on the, on the game, and he was asking the team, yeah, why did AlphaGo make, play this move? No, no human being would play this move in this situation. And then the, the team that developed it said, yeah, we have no idea. We, we programmed it, but we, we have no idea why it's doing this, these moves. And this is also very dangerous if we don't know why the system are doing stuff like that. So this is the first big issue, transparency, interpretability, explainability. The second issue is that systems are biased and can, ex can exhibit prejudice. And I want to show this in a small live demo. I hope this is going to work. So I think all of you know like Google Translate, right? Translate. So Google Translate is now also based on machine learning. It, it has fed lots of data and it can now translate stuff. And if, for example, do the following, say, she's a doctor, he is a nurse in English, and then you translate it. So now I translate it into, let's say, Turkish, because Turkish is a language where um, there's no differentiation between gender. So in Turkish, um, you don't have gender, basically. And then you translate it back. So what would you expect what happens? Yeah, so it mixes up the genders. So now it's he's a doctor and she's a nurse. So the system implicitly assumed that if it's a doctor, it must be a, a male. If it's a nurse, it must be a female. So it, it is a sexist system, actually. Google Translate is sexist. And why is this the case? Well, it was fed um, by data on the internet. And on the internet, people write sexist things, right? People, I don't know, maybe it's, it's even there, there is a correlation. I mean, there are probably more male doctors than female, but even then, it's just a prejudice. It doesn't mean that every doctor must be male and every nurse must be female, right? So these systems ex exhibit prejudice, and this is a huge problem. Let's go back. Oh yeah, this is Google Translate. So another thing that Professor Halbing was pointing out, in the US they're using machine learning algorithms to, to, like, to predict whether criminals will be criminal again or who will be a criminal, and this is bias against blacks. So blacks have a higher possibility to be classified as criminals, although they're probably not cr more criminal than white people. But again, we feed them with our data and they will just mirror these, these biases that are in the data. And there was this Microsoft system tie it was a chatbot on Twitter. They put it online, and they let it learn from the tweets that people sent to them. 
And then after less than 25, uh, 24 hours, she was um, tweeting stuff like this. So very racist, very sexist stuff. And this is just because people made a joke out of tweeting very sexist and racist comments to this bot and the bot learned from it and it replicated everything. And what this actually is, it's actually a mirror of society. So these systems are built upon the data we give it and it will just reflect back what we give into it, right? I mean, a computer is just as a child. It doesn't question anything. It cannot question anything. So what we put in gets out. So actually, this is the problem. Like The data we give into the system is biased, is sexist, is racist, and the machines just reinforce this, they replicate this, and these systems will have these biases. So that's where we need to step on and to start to make a change. So now the big question is, how can we actually develop AI systems that um, develop an AI that is interpretable and transparent for humans so that we can understand the decisions that they make, especially in situations where, for example, human lives are dependent on the system? How can we make systems that are free of biases and prejudices because we want to live in a society where we don't have these, right? So all in all, the question is how can we actually develop um, an AI system that is beneficial to society as a whole? And this is actually what I want to discuss with you now. Um, how do you think can we achieve this? What kind of regulations do you think we need? Is it actually possible to achieve this? And I will just close with a um, comic. So there are some politicians saying AI needs to be regulated. And then people say, no, no, we don't want to. We, we love AI. And then, yeah, that was your last chance. It's too late. So we should better start now and start working on regulations in order to make this beneficial for everyone. Thank you very much.